everybody. Welcome back to my Zero Carb Life. I'm Kelly Hogan, and I'm joined by Dr. Philip Avadia. And I'm so excited to be here with him today. Dr. Avadia, the last time I hung out with you, we were in Costa Rica. That was a good time, right? Yes, it was. That's gorgeous. Now, I am going to link below so that people can hear your full story, which is absolutely incredible. But just quickly, Share with people, how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so uh, I am a heart surgeon, a cardiac surgeon, and I was a very unhealthy uh, cardiac surgeon. I was morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic. And I realized that I was destined for my own operating table, so to speak. Um, And this was despite the fact that I was following the advice that I had learned to give all my patients. We've all heard it before, eat less, move more, eat a low fat diet. And I realized that like so many of my patients um, who had been following that advice, it wasn't working for me and it wasn't working for them. The short version of the story is I heard Gary Taubes uh, talk at a medical conference. I cut out sugar. I went low carb. Um, I lost a hundred pounds. I reversed my pre-diabetes and, you know, I went through an evolution of kind of more and more low carb until I came to carnivore, uh, for about four years ago now. And really that's what has worked best for me. That's what allows me to maintain my healthy life. What I discovered along the way is that our approach to heart disease And really our approach to chronic disease in general within the mainstream medical system is wrong. Uh, We are not addressing the root cause, which is metabolic health and insulin resistance. And that's why I now want to educate people and I want people to understand how the key to preventing heart disease, the key to preventing most of the chronic disease that our society suffers from lies in addressing metabolic health and insulin resistance. And the best way to do that is with diet, lifestyle, carbohydrate restriction. And I think the carnivore diet in particular is a very powerful tool to accomplish that. Heck yes, man, I love that. What a great intro. Oh my gosh, I didn't know you were going to mention Gary Tobbs, but I just recently reread this book, Why We Get Fat, What to Do About It. And to sum it up, basically, it's the carbs, the carbs, why we get fat, it's the carbs, what to do about it, cut them out and get your insulin down. Is that basically a solid, yeah. right? You know, that's basically what it comes down to. Here's something for you. About a year and a half to two years ago, I went to a new doctor. I used to have an amazing uh, doctor, just general practitioner. He retired. In fact, that guy, Dr. Dunlap, was the whole reason that I first started eating this way. It was his recommendation. He was amazing. But then he retired in his late 80s, and I was trying to find a new doctor. I went to a doctor who said, as many probably say, you should only be eating red meat two times per week and then they gave me a handout as i left saying to replace saturated fat with canola oil it specified canola oil are your patients ever surprised to hear a doctor actually recommend red meat oh yes uh you know certainly uh to hear a heart surgeon who is uh you know advocating that we should be eating red meat probably two times a day um, as opposed to two times a week. And, you know, that you shouldn't really be worried about the fat uh, that comes in that meat. Um, You know, if you want to eat fatty uh, cuts of meat, there's really no reason that we need to be concerned about that Um, in the proper context. If you are eating red meat as part of a standard American diet, high in processed food, um, Yes, that diet is harmful for you, Uh, but it's not the red meat in the diet that's doing it. It's all the other stuff in the diet. It is the processed food. It is the processed oils. It is the canola oil that they are recommending to you uh, that, um, you know, is contributing to uh, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, um, and all these other metabolic uh, disorders. When you tell people, I only eat red meat, essentially, um, you know, now they really look at you like you're crazy. Um, But, you know, we have the evidence again, you know, 
this was our primary diet for much of our existence as human beings. Um, and we have many, you know, modern day examples uh, like yourself of people who have done this are doing it and are in the best health of their life. I can point to my own health journey and show how much my health has improved um, as I ate more and more meat and less and less carbohydrates. All right. I took questions from some of my group members, Dr. Avadia. So right. one of the top questions was, which markers do you consider the most valuable and telling when it comes to predicting a future heart disease or future heart issues? Right. So, you know, it comes down to insulin resistance. And, you know, this really shouldn't be controversial. Uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I did a talk uh, at one of the low carb meetings, and I went back through the literature and looked at all of the studies that compared the, the heart disease risk associated with, you know, the various blood markers. And I focused in on insulin resistance and cholesterol, specifically LDL or total cholesterol. And in every one of those studies that looked at both, Insulin resistance was always a more powerful marker of heart disease risk than total or LDL cholesterol is. And it's usually by a pretty wide margin. Um, you know, the, the women's health study that came out a few years ago showed that the risk associated with insulin resistance um, was about a 10x risk uh, versus about a 1.5x risk associated with having an elevated LDL cholesterol level. Clearly, insulin resistance is the most powerful marker that we can look at for heart disease risk. There are a few different ways that you can measure that. You can start, first of all, just with a fasting insulin level is the easiest one to do. Based on your fasting insulin and your fasting glucose level, you can calculate what's called a HOMA IR. I am a big fan of uh, what is called the lipoprotein insulin resistance score. And this is a uh, measure of insulin resistance based on the distribution of your lipid particle sizes. Uh, so it comes from doing the advanced lipid panel. Uh, but, you know, ultimately insulin resistance is what is driving uh, metabolic disease, including heart disease. And I think that's, you know, the metric we should be looking at. What do you want to see on a fasting insulin score? So I think ideal is less than seven. I think under 10 is acceptable. If you're in the sort of seven to 10, maybe six to 10 range, uh, you do need to be concerned that you may still have insulin resistance or that you may have insulin resistance. Uh, now, one other caveat in here um, is if you have a longstanding history of type two diabetes, mm -hmm. um, your fasting insulin level uh, might not be informative because people that have type two diabetes for a long period of time, uh, especially if it goes untreated, um, essentially become type one diabetics and they stop making insulin. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to make sure that your low fasting insulin level is combined with a low blood glucose level, a low fasting glucose level. Because uh, if you have a low insulin level and a uh, and your glucose level is even mildly elevated, you know, like 105, uh, that's a major red flag that you probably have significant. Uh, underlying insulin resistance, and you may have even gotten to a point where your body is no longer able to make adequate insulin. Oh, yeah. I have heard about people getting diagnosed later on as type 1 because, yes, they have super low insulin and super high glucose. In other words, you're not spraying much water, but your fire is out of control, right? Yep. Yeah. So, I haven't had anything but animal products in 13 and a half years. I don't think I've told you yet what my fasting insulin is. Do you already know that? Uh, no, I don't think I've seen that. It's less than seven. <laughs> there we uh, go. 1.5. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, that's what we see, uh, you know, people who uh, abstain from carbohydrates, uh, have very low fasting insulin levels, carbohydrate restriction, is a very powerful tool and it is the most powerful tool when it comes to uh, metabolic health and insulin resistance. The earlier you start it, the better you're going to be. Um, you know, it can be a challenge in people, like I said, who come to me and they've been type 2 diabetics for 20 years and they've been, you know, 
eating carbohydrates that whole time because that's what they're told they're supposed to be doing and taking their medication and you know getting them to become insulin sensitive again can be very challenging no matter what point you're at in this journey the less carbohydrates you're putting into your body uh the less insulin your body needs to make to deal with those carbohydrates uh so you know lowering the amount of carbohydrate um, is always going to be an improvement some people may not be able to get all the way uh, they may not be able to get your excellent numbers, uh, but they can still improve uh, from where they are. Yeah. Other than diet, what else could they do if they if somebody wants to get those numbers down, especially somebody who didn't start carbohydrate restriction at age 25? I'm so lucky that Dr. Dunlap told me that. But a lot of people don't know till they're, say, 55. What can they yeah. do to bring that down? Well, I think the second most important thing after um, the diet is building muscle. Uh, building and maintaining muscle is the you know next best tool we have to improving our metabolic health. Uh, muscle um, is first of all a place where our body can store excess sugar and excess carbohydrates. Uh, so building muscle, resistance exercise, getting adequate protein intake um, becomes the next tool that I use to help people improve their metabolic health. Eat meat, lift heavy things. Yep. That's <laughs> what it comes down to. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I was going to get a particle test done for the very first time recently, and I did, and I'm going to share those results and ask you to look over it with me. But my good friend, Siobhan Huggins, who is a co-founder of ownyourlabs.com with Dave Feldman, she said to me, you know, it's a $68 test. She had already seen my standard cheap lipid panel. Yeah. She said, your HDL is higher than your triglycerides. There's no reason for you to pay for a $68 particle test because when we track that data, people who have a ratio of, I believe she said 1.5, so triglycerides divided by HDL of 1.5 or below tend to have large fluffy particles and tend to not be insulin resistant what do you think? You you with her on that? Is that pretty true? Yeah, I think that the triglyceride to HDL ratio is a very good proxy. You know, your goal for your ratio should be less than two um, triglycerides divided by HDL. Importantly, it needs to be in the U.S. units. You need to be working in milligrams per deciliter for that uh, ratio uh, to be accurate. It's different if you're working in millimoles. Under 1.5 is certainly ideal, and I would agree that the, the vast majority of people with that ratio are going to be insulin sensitive, are going to have you know large fluffy particles that we want as opposed to small dense particles. Um, there are some exceptions though. First of all, if you're taking um, uh, cholesterol lowering medication, statins in particular uh, being most common, I've noticed that sometimes that ratio, even though statins aren't supposed to affect your HDL and your, tr your triglycerides, uh, I, I, they do. Uh, and I notice people who have a good ratio, but they're still insulin resistant uh, when they're on those medications. Uh, so that's a caveat. Yeah. So I think her advice to me, because she knows I'm not taking anything. She knows I'm not diabetic. She yep. knows I'm having no problems. was probably spot on, right? There's no need to spend that. But also... I wanted to, so I did it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I and I agree. A lot of the reasons that uh, people come to me, and you know, we end up going through this exercise and checking the advanced particles and all of that, is because they've been told their high LDL cholesterol is a problem in yep. this context of low triglycerides and high HDL. And now we're trying to basically prove to them, prove to their other doctors uh, that it's not a problem. Yes. And, you know, again, getting the advanced lipid panel, looking at the particle sizes can be one of the ways, uh, you know, that we can help to prove something that we never really should have needed to prove in the first place. That's why I went to get a CAC scan. As yep. soon as my LDL tripped 100, and it was at that point 101. This doctor said, I'd like to have the discussion about a statin. And I was like, yeah, I, 
Really? 101? And also, I'll say that even back in October, I went and looked. My LDL at that point was 74. My LDL last week was 133. LDL to me is like, I I've had it checked annually at least and three times in the last six months because I've been doing some experiments and because I discovered ownyourlabs.com so I can just go when I want to. Yeah. But LDL fluctuates. And I'm thinking, you're going to medicate me for going up one point when, you know, a few months ago. And by the way, all on the same all meat diet. It's not like six months ago I was eating plant based. Right. Same diet. To me, that's crazy. So I said, uh, since I tripped the 101 mark, I said, well, before we talk about a statin, could we see what's really going on in there? So they agreed. I paid out of pocket, though, to go have a CAC scan. It came back as a zero. And the doctor just left me alone. And actually, I ended up moving. So I, I didn't go back to that doctor. But is there ever a time when you do think someone should go on a statin? So, you know, if you have a high LDL cholesterol and you're insulin resistant, uh, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, if you're metabolically unhealthy, if you have inflammation and you have a high cholesterol level, that is a problem. Okay. Um, now you can take the approach of trying to lower your LDL cholesterol, whether by medications, dietary changes. Um, and that is going to have a small effect in that context, but you can get a much bigger effect by reversing your insulin resistance, lowering your inflammation. And then in that context, in the context of someone who is metabolically healthy, who is not insulin resistant, who doesn't have inflammation, we really don't have any data to show that lowering LDL is of any benefit. And uh, in fact, there's data to the contrary that having a higher LDL in that context uh, may be beneficial. So um, that's the discussion that I end up having with people. Um, you know, it's not that LDL is completely meaningless. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that everyone should be comfortable walking around with a high LDL level. Yeah. It's that if you have addressed the other things, if you are insulin sensitive, um, if you are metabolically healthy, uh, then, you know, there probably isn't any benefit to lowering LDL cholesterol. It is ignoring what is the actual driver of heart disease the insulin resistance. Yeah, there was a large study done. I'm sure you've seen it. I love looking at this. It was 36,000 patients and they took their lipid profiles as they were being admitted for a heart attack. 72% of them fell into normal range of LDL. Right. And it's like, if 72% were normal, why are we striving for lower, lower, lower? But what I have learned recently is that that total LDL amount that most people get on that lipid panel, it it doesn't distinguish whatsoever. In fact, you could even have perfectly normal, like, wow, way to go with your low LDL and still have a large number of small particles contained within that. So it's it's just not that helpful. Now, look what Dave Feldman's mother made for me. Are you ready for this? It's beautiful. Oh, it's a large, That's fluffy, a large, fluffy particle. This is our friend, right? This yeah. is our friend. And this is why I wanted to pay the $68 for a particle test is to make sure that this is what I've got and that it's not the tiny, dense, sticky, hard kind of LDL, which, like I said, even if your LDL is below 100, you could have tons of that. I'm going to do a screen share. All right, here we go. Um, this is what I ordered, Dr. Avadia. It was the right. NMR Lipo Profile, and I did do this from the Own Your Labs, which works with LabCorp, and there are tons of these companies. I'm not affiliated with these guys. I just happen to really love Dave Feldman and Siobhan. <laughs> so it also comes with that insulin resistance test that you talked about, the score, yep. And I found the graph to be incredibly helpful. So I had this test done last Thursday, the um, less than a week ago. And I had the results back on Friday, the very next day. It was just a quick blood draw. And this is what came back. When we talk about large and fluffy, this is what they call pattern A, correct? And if you get this test done, 
that's what people are mostly looking for, right? Yeah, I would say that's probably the ma the major thing that uh, people look at. You know, that's sort of the summary. And all those numbers below that are part of the determination. But pattern A versus pattern B is basically the summary that I tell people to look at. Uh, okay. Pattern B is bad um, and uh, pattern A is good. And then you can see below there, um, you know, how that correlates with insulin sensitivity as we get into more and more of the numbers there of the different types of particles. And we can put that all together. And this is what, uh, you know, the score does. The LPIR score uh, basically summarizes, um, you know, all of your particles and uh, where you are on the insulin sensitivity scale. Awesome. I'm going to come back to this, but I'm going to skip over here. I'm sometimes curious, like, what does the non-carnivore world say about small particles? When I came over to Google this at a website that's pretty popular, Health Matters, uh, came over here and it does say these small particles are associated with an increased risk of heart disease. Cool. Uh, people are generally at lower risk for heart disease if their small LDLP is less than 700. So I had looked at this page before I got my results back. So I thought, okay, what we're looking for is less than 700. But I have heard somebody say, you know, less than 500 is really like, that's what we're really going for is less than 500. And I will, I'd love to know what you look for. But look what, this kills me. I scrolled down. What does it mean if your small LDLP is too high? Well, it means you're at increased risk of heart disease. So what do we do about it, Dr. Ovadia? Oh, of course. Adopt a whole foods plant-based diet. I'm like, great. That's just the answer they give for most everything. Well, this is me. Mine is not at 700 or 500. I haven't had plants in 13 years. It won't even register. It's below 90. How can they be so wrong? Yeah, well, that's always the question. And, you know, one other um, sort of contextual um, issue uh, that we get into here is um, understand that, you know, this number uh, is simply looking at the number of small particles, uh, you know, in a, in a certain volume. Um, so there are people who have a, a high number of small LDL particles. Their, their particle count will be over 500, okay. um, yet they're still pattern A. And on a percentage basis, um, you know, if they have a lot of LDL particles around, um, you know, they're still going to be okay. okay. Uh, so it, it, all of this becomes, you know, it, there is no one magic number is the bottom line. Awesome. You, you might have some mixed messaging in that, uh, you know, one number will be, you know, what is considered in the high range or the abnormal range. Uh, another, you know, other numbers are going to be in the low and normal ranges. And you have to really contextualize the whole picture. And then you can look at something like a coronary artery calcium scan, as you mentioned, uh, that's actually going to show us, do you have damage in your blood vessels? Do you have plaque forming in your blood vessels? Uh, because that is ultimately what we care about. No one feels their high cholesterol numbers. Uh, you know, it, it's not a problem uh, that people notice. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of people with high cholesterol numbers who don't end up developing heart disease. And um, again, there's no reason that we uh, should be concerned about that if you're not developing heart disease. Uh, so um, it's really the heart disease that we want to know about. And so that's why I'm such a big fan of the coronary artery calcium scan. Uh, but, you know, that's not something that's practical to do um, as frequently as blood work is. Uh, so, you know, we have to look at some of these blood markers, but we always have to be keeping in mind the context of all of this. If somebody does go and get a CAC scan, let's say they've eaten high amounts of carbs for the last 30 years, and now they just went carnivore, and I'll have new carnivores. It's been, you know, even if it's been three months, then they go get a CAC scan and they go, oh my gosh, it was 200. Maybe it's the meat. And I'm like, that did not happen in the last three months. Whatever right. was there. 
Now, there are some doctors who say you can't reduce a CAC scan. I've already seen people personally who have done it. Have you have reversed as in it's gone backwards from that number? Um, yeah, so I have uh, worked with people who have lowered their scores some. Like you, I know people who report that they've gone from, you know, a couple of hundred back to zero. Yep. Um, you know, I, I usually see more modest reductions, you know, right. 10, 15% reductions. What we really know is as long as you stop it from getting worse, yeah. um, that that's what's important. You know, if you don't have clinical evidence of heart disease today, if you're not having symptoms of heart disease, whatever your CAC score is, if we can just stop it from getting worse, you're probably going to be fine. Uh, we know that the average uh, progression of coronary artery calcium scores is somewhere in the 10 to 20% uh, per year range. Wow. And we know that if, you, if your CAC score progresses slower than that, uh, you know, less than 5% uh, in a year, that puts you back into a lower risk category uh, when it comes to the development of a heart attack. Many people only become aware of coronary artery calcium scans um, when they go low carb, when they go carnivore. Uh, you know, this isn't something that's widely discussed uh, in mainstream medicine. And so, you know, people are oftentimes getting their first scan after they've been on these diets for a little while, on these lifestyles for a little while. And then the question is, oh, well, you know, was it the, you know, was it the low carb that did it? Or was it the 40 years of high carb standard American diet before that that did it? And, you know, I kind of go with the odds there. Uh, but the, the great thing about the coronary artery calcium scan in that situation is we say, okay, Stick to your, you know, low carb carnivore, keto, whatever it is for a year. And then let's repeat the scan and see what happens. And if yeah. it's not going up further, that's pretty good evidence that what you're doing is, is working for you. I like that. I do. I like that. All right. If you have somebody who says, oh, Dr. Avedia, my CAC scan uh, came back at, let's say, a 500. I am going total carnivore. And I am going to work out, lift resistance training and walks four times a week. Should, and if they ask this, should I also be taking some supplements or do anything else to get that number to either stop going up or to go down? Yeah, so I think, you know, all of those things you talked about are probably the mainstays. So the most common supplements that I recommend in this situation uh, end up being uh, vitamin K2, uh, and that's usually going to be taken with vitamin D. Uh, so it's important, you know, check your vitamin D levels, first of all, uh, see where you're at. Now, vitamin K2 is in, anim you know, it comes from animal products. So if you're eating a carnivore diet, you need to supplement additional vitamin K2 on top of that. It's hard to know, uh, you know, no one's ever really looked at it. We, we can't measure vitamin K2 levels uh, easily. Uh, so it's it's not even like, you know, vitamin D, at least we can measure the level. And, and if your level's 60, I'm gonna tell you, okay, there's probably not much benefit to taking additional vitamin D. Um, vitamin K2, we can't do that as much. So I tend to err on the side of caution and tell people to take vitamin K2. Um, vitamin K2 regulates um, our body's calcium stores, basically where the calcium ends up. And vitamin K2 signals your body essentially to put the calcium in your bones where you want it and not have it go into your blood vessel walls where we don't want it. So okay. that's why K2 is so important. But in general, I think if you are adherent to a very low carbohydrate diet, you eliminate processed food, you're getting adequate uh, resistance exercise, uh, you're building muscle and you're improving your metabolic health, that's going to take you a long way towards stopping the progression of your heart disease. Cool. Thanks. Is there anybody that you think should not try a carnivore diet? No, at this point, there really isn't. Um, you know, at least give it a try is what I tell people. Uh, you know, I am very confident in saying it's not going to hurt you to try a carnivore diet for 30, 60, 90 days uh, and see how you feel, see how it does for you. There's the adjustment period that, you know, can be more difficult for some people. 
uh, again, working with a good practitioner, uh, you know, whether that's a doctor or a coach or, or a nutritionist, you know, whoever it is that understands this and can help you through that is key. Um, you know, it can be difficult for people who have been doing the standard American diet just to go straight to a carnivore diet. Um, most of them feel better, uh, but, you know, a few of them have some uh, complicating factors, shall we say, you know, they haven't eaten meat for a long time. They have a lot of gut issues. Um, you know, if they've had their gallbladder taken out, you know, th these are some issues that come up and they're not insurmountable. Uh, but you need to be working with someone good who understands that. I've got group members right now. And as you're saying these different issues, I can picture and name them. I had a lady last month. She took her first bite of animal product in 10 years on one of my group meeting calls. Yeah. She's been vegan for 10 years and she saved that bite for our group call. And we were all so excited, but also she was nauseated for the next few days. She was not, her stomach acids had to adjust. She wasn't used to it. By the end of the month, she was feeling good, but it took some group effort to get her through that month. You're right. It's not easy for some people. Let's take me as an example. I'm feeling better at age 44 than I did at age 24. I don't include any plants at all, except I do drink coffee that touched plants every morning. <laughs> That's the closest thing to a plant or um, some black pepper. That's it. Do you think there's a reason for me or someone like me to add back plants? No, I, I, I don't think there is. You know, everything looks good. You're feeling good. Your numbers look good. Plants are clearly not essential to our diet. Uh, now, if you want to add plants, if someone in your situation says, I, I just want to eat, you know, some broccoli once in a while or whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, my response is usually, well, give it a try, you know, yeah. see what happens. Uh, for some people, plants just can't be tolerated. You know, it sets off autoimmune issues. It sets off gut issues. Um, for other people, you know, you can tolerate it. And if you want to have it and, and you're tolerating it well, I have no problem with that. I, I think one of the big differences we see between, you know, kind of carnivore and vegan is, you know, we don't need to be dogmatic about carnivore. We're not kicking people out of the carnivore community. If you have some broccoli or you have some avocado every once yeah. in a while uh, or, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, this is about. A, a sustainable, lifelong um, way of eating. And if it's working for you, that's what matters to me ultimately. Uh, let's just make sure we're looking at the right things to, to know whether or not it's working for us. And you know, one of the things that I notice in people who go carnivore, when they experience how good they're truly supposed to feel on a day-to-day -day basis, and then they try and reintroduce some of these things, and they get the the gut issues or they, you know, get more, you know, more tired, they get the brain fog comes back. So it gives you the true sense of how you're supposed to feel, what ideal is. And then, you know, it's up to you to choose if you want to accept less than ideal uh, with some of these things. When I have a group member ask, can I add back avocado? I'm, I love your attitude and I feel the same way. There's no rule book. The question is, I don't know, can you? Because I really can't. Um, I had a lot of IBS issues before yep. that got so much better, not just when I cut out processed foods, but even when I cut out the vegetables at the end, things got even better and better. So I'll say, I can't, but there's no prize for cutting out more stuff. If you feel great with avocado and meat, that's kind of how I feel about my coffee. I've cut it out many times. I add it back. I don't feel anything worse. I could either feel great with coffee or great without coffee. I'm just going to feel great with coffee. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm with you. No rule books. Just feel good and get good results. Yeah. When, speaking of coffee, here's something that I have noticed in myself but I can't find a lot of research about it yet. When I'm going for blood work, my doctor has said, and even at LabCorp on the paperwork, it will say fasted means that you've had nothing to eat or drink except water or black coffee. It always yeah. says this. Well, I've tested this. My triglycerides will show up twice as high if I have black coffee before the testing is done. 
have you what do you know about this yeah so this is something that uh some people notice you know i i've run the same experiment myself and i haven't seen a difference okay um the uh there have been a few uh you know there are a few studies in the scientific literature that look at this uh, and they largely show that it doesn't make a difference, which is why LabCorp and your doctor say it's okay to have black coffee. Um, the mechanism um, that some people see that response is a little unclear. Uh, it probably has to do with the oils, the, the diterpenes that are in coffee beans mm -hmm. uh, and their interaction. Um, and it's probably, you know, at this point, I would probably say, it's some sort of genetic issue because it only affects certain people. Uh, but uh, but we don't, you know, I can't tell you to go check for a certain gene to figure out if it's going to affect you. So again, this is another situation where, um, you know, you have to run the experiment on yourself. If uh, you're eating a very low carbohydrate diet uh, and your triglycerides are remaining high uh, and you're drinking coffee, then yeah, I'm going to want you to eliminate coffee for a couple of weeks and repeat your triglyceride level and see if if you're one of these responders, uh, you know, or not. Um, it, it's just one of the things that we look at, you know, in people whose triglycerides aren't coming down as we expect them to. Uh, but it seems to be, like I said, in a uh, an individualized reaction. And the only way to know is, you know, is it applicable to your situation is to do the experiment, check your triglycerides after not having had coffee for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then, you know, uh, see if it differs from what it is when you're on, you know, when you're drinking coffee. Whatever the effect is seems to be short lived. So if I cut it out for three days, no, I just did this three weeks ago. I cut out coffee for three days and then I cut out coffee for 16 days to see if it made any difference between three days versus about two weeks. No, it was about five points, but it yeah. does seem for me, again, if I have it within 24 hours, especially the morning of doubled. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And it, and it, you know, it may even be more complex than that. It might have to do with the type of coffee and okay. how you prepare it. Uh, you know, uh, we really, Again, it's not something that has, uh, there's a whole lot of research interest into, I guess. Uh, I know, you know, going back to Dave Feldman, I know he's done some experiments around it. I know others in the low carb community have, um, you know, but uh, it, it, it's, I would say it's probably a minor issue, um, but for someone who, you know, is truly adhering to a low carb diet um, and their triglycerides are staying elevated, uh, if you're drinking coffee, it's it's one of the factors to consider. And, you know, uh, again, what does that even mean? You know, right. uh, does it mean that you, coffee is harmful for you? Uh, or does it just mean that co coffee affects this blood test, but it's not yeah. really having, you know, I would I would venture a guess that the the sort of physiologic effects of a triglyceride level that's raised a little bit from coffee is nowhere near, uh, you know, the triglycerides being raised because you're eating sugar and carbohydrates all the time. Okay. Um, but again, I, we, we don't have good data to say that. Uh, right. And someone like yourself, I would say your coronary artery calcium score is zero. Everything else looks good. Um, there's probably not a whole lot of difference uh, whether your triglyceride level is 80 or 110. Okay. Uh, to be honest. Okay. All right. That's good to hear because I really do enjoy that cup of coffee. Okay. On the list of questions that were submitted, we've covered almost everything. I did have one person ask if it's possible for triglycerides to be too low. The lowest I've ever seen was a very high fat carnivore who got her triglycerides down to 17. I've never seen that in anybody else. The lowest mine have ever been is in the 40s. Um, mine typically run. 60 to 80 is where mine stay. Have you ever been concerned to say, oh, that's too low for triglycerides? Uh, again, it becomes a question of what are you doing to lower your triglycerides? If you're doing it maybe with medications, um, maybe there is too low, you know, if you're kind of doing it unnaturally, 
I haven't really seen any concerns about too low a triglyceride level. Uh, 17, you know, 20s, I might start to look into. And is there something else going on in that person that's causing them to be, you know, causing their triglyceride levels to be so exceedingly low? Uh, you know, it, it, it might raise my interest a little bit, but I can't point to any particular problem of too low a triglyceride level. This particular person was just the picture of health, completely unmedicated and eating steak all day long. Yeah. I don't know why. Um, I have no idea why hers were so low, but she seemed to feel great. All right. When I work with people, I do refer to you often because I'll tell you that a lot of people who are eating more and more meat after decades of their own doctors telling them, don't do that. Don't do that. Then they join a part of our coaching group and we're working on eating all the meat. They're scared. And I understand that they're scared. So I will frequently send them your talks. I know this is going to be helpful to people, but I tell them eating meat, fatty meat, that is exactly what humans have been eating. Just like you were saying, we've been eating fatty meat for far longer than we've been eating Little Debbie's sunshine, walking, moving heavy things, human connection, sleep, all of these things. I've been making humans healthy for so very long. And it's just incredibly refreshing to hear from someone who literally operates and works with heart patients all day for you to say, yes, this, that's what humans need to be doing. So thank you. We need you, Dr. Avadia. So thankful for you. Yeah. And thank you for everything you're doing. You know, uh, the community that um, is pushing, you know, is, is helping to promote this, helping to make people aware of this uh, is really essential. You know, we we are in a situation where, you know, the mainstream messaging has been so powerful, so ingrained people on the idea that meat is bad for them, uh, that we really need the community uh, to push back and to start, you know, to be out there. Um, and to show our success stories, you know, I think that's ultimately what's most powerful. Um, and I'm I'm kind of humbled every day when I see the people who, you know, say they read my book and and they've overcome all of this stuff. And uh, they discovered all the, you know, all the great low carbon carnivore doctors out there. Uh, and we just need to keep pushing this message, keep getting it accepted uh, that this is a viable way to improve your health. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not out there telling everyone you need to be 100% carnivore, uh, but I want everyone to know that it is an option and that many people have seen dramatic health improvements from doing that uh, and that we shouldn't just, we shouldn't be discouraging it just based on some very poorly done science uh, and some quite frankly, very good marketing uh, that has gone into the narrative that meat is bad for us. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, Team Meat, man. I, it's such an honor to have you and to be on the team with you, Team Meat. Thank you so much. And again, it was so great to hang out with you in Costa Rica. And I look forward to seeing the reverse series, hopefully to continue spreading the message that yes, it's a thing. Carnivore, it's a thing. Eat your meat. Save some humans. Thank you so much, Dr. Vadia. Thanks, Kelly. Great seeing you again. Thank you.